Selection Sunday. My favorite weekend of the whole year, man. And I want to tell you something. Just four days ago, TJ, you have that picture for me? Maybe. Four days ago, I was in this tomb, and I want you to see that this tomb is still empty. You're not hearing me. This tomb is still, that's where they laid him. That's where he got back up. Other people say they worship other gods. Their God's still dead. Our God is alive. If that don't fire you up, baby, I don't know what's going to work for you today. I walked in that tomb, and every time I go, I'm like, woo, it's still empty. That fires me up, man. Well, if it's your first time to TWC, um, I don't apologize for my behavior. Uh, <laughs> But, but I'm glad to be home. I'm glad to be with my family. We just got back from Israel on Thursday. And so we're still trying to get our sleep schedule regulated. And uh, now I got regulated song in my head. <laughs> Pray for your pastor. And so uh, we're trying to get that. I was up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. I felt like happy days, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Anyway, so we're glad to be here, man. And I hope that you leave this place today and you can say it was good for me to be in the house of God. And so can we really quickly give our first-time guests and our online campus a big hand this morning? Yeah, man, thanks for tuning in. Well, we spent the last six weeks, and if you missed any of this series, I really encourage you to go back and catch this whole series. I've been uh, preaching for 32 years, and in 32 years, this is my favorite series that I've ever done. I've been waiting to preach this for 10 years, and I finally got it all out. So I, I encourage you to go back and check it out. But we're talking about the Passion Week, and today is our conclusion of this series, and I hope that you've been blessed by it. You know, Jesus lived uh, a little over 33 years on earth, and the Gospels are the stories of his life from birth until he ascends into heaven. And what's interesting to me, though, is most of the Gospels aren't stretched out over his entire life. In fact, a third of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are about this one week alone. And the book of John, almost half of that book is dedicated to the final week of Jesus' life on earth. And I just think if the Bible focuses on that, the church ought to focus on that as well. Amen? And so today we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to look at John's account. But there's also something else that John talked about other than the resurrection that might surprise you that we're going to look at as well. So John chapter 20, verse 1, if you have your Bibles. If not, we got the free Bible on screen. All of my notes are in the YouVersion Bible app. You can get them there. But it says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone, saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. I want y'all to know, who's writing this? John. I want you to look how John talks about himself, right? She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Like, I'm going to just throw it at Peter. I'm the one he loved. And he said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and they don't know, we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but watch, there's John again. But the other disciple outran Peter. I mean, John's just telling it all. Peter ain't got nothing on me. And he reached the tomb first, and he bent over, and he looked in at the strips of the linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, he's not done. The one who reached the tomb first, I want everybody to know, we got 12 of us, but I'm the fastest one, okay? <laughs> also went inside, and he saw, and he believed. Can, can we just take one more moment to celebrate the fact that our God's not dead, that he's alive? <laughs> Amen. That's so good. Now, this right here is the account of the resurrection and, and nothing else, but John has a whole lot more to write in John chapter 20, and he's got a whole nother chapter to write in John 21, and so did the other gospels, and they gave the vast majority of the real estate of what happened on Resurrection Sunday, not to the resurrection, which surprised me. They gave it to something else, and, and this is now that Jesus would appear to people, and there's going to be at least five appearances 
after the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday alone, and at least 10 more times after that, before he goes up into heaven, and I believe him showing up tells us something. I believe that it shows the heart of God who had already spent 33 years on earth appearing to people, praying for people, healing people, interacting with people, and loving people, relating to people. And I think that nature was still in him, and he just couldn't help it. He kept showing up and doing what he's always done, and that is being there for people. Can you say amen? amen. And I think he wants to show us something in this as well. I want you to know that God is still appearing to people. That he just can't help it. It's just his nature to show up and show off when he gets there. And what's interesting is the unlikely people, though, in my opinion, that Jesus did appear to. And I hope that this will be something to you. And I hope you never forget this message today. Because the first person that Jesus shows up to was not a disciple. Although the Bible doesn't list her as a disciple, I consider her to be one of the disciples. Very much so. She was there with him when they'd done everything else. And he didn't show up at a church. And he didn't show up to the religious. And he didn't show up to somebody that was super holy. He showed up to a woman named Mary. And it shows me that Jesus values everybody. Can I tell you that this morning? That Jesus loves everybody. Even the ones that the church overlooks sometimes. Even the ones that the church don't want in there, and they say they can't get in there, but God says, I don't care if you can get into church, you can get into my family. And I just want you to know at the worship center, you can come any way you are. We don't care. You can come broke, busted, and disgusted. We're just glad you're here. If you're hungover from last night, I'm just glad you're here. If you're still stoned from this morning, I am just glad you're here. If you just got off a stripper pole, I am glad you're here. It ain't about dressing up. It ain't about looking good. It's about getting in his presence. Can you say amen? And if any of that offends you, you need to talk to Jesus. I'm mad at my past. Don't be mad at me. I'm just reading the Bible. Your problem's not with me. Your problem's with religion. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I just got back, and I'm already mean. Anyway, he goes and... Let me show it to you. The guys have left, and Mary is there, and she's heartbroken. And I want to say to anybody that may be here this morning that you're listening, and if you have a hurt, or you have a wound, or if you have something that someplace that's been broken on the inside of you, if you have something going on, and you're really not okay, and if you're like most of the church people, you don't tell anybody, you just put on that smile, and you wave, and, and you, how are you doing? I'm doing good, and nobody knows that you cried yourself to sleep last night, and nobody knows when you get in your car, you cry all the way home. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Do we got any real people here this morning that are tired of wearing masks, and you're just ready to be who God called you to be and get healed in his presence? Watch this, John 20. He's, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where uh, Jesus' body had been, one at the head and other at the foot. And I don't have time to preach this, but if you'll notice, that's the perfect picture of the Ark of the Covenant. I just throw that on out there. It's still, Old Testament is still being fulfilled in the New Testament, okay? And uh, they ask her, woman... Why are you crying? And I want, to, I want you to notice this. When you cry, heaven notices. I said, when you're broken, heaven notices. And you may think it doesn't because when you're hurting, you're hurting so bad that you can't really see anything but the pain. You can't really see anything but the hurt. But I'm telling you, heaven notices when you're broken. And it says, she says, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was him. That's interesting to me as well because she had been with him for three years. She knew who he was. She recognized his voice. If, if you read other accounts, it says they supposed he was the gardener. And why? Because he, he was probably dirty and probably had things all over him. You say, Todd, why? Where had he been? He had been fighting hell. Go back and read your Bible. He wasn't in the tomb for three days. He was whooping tail in hell. You're not hearing what I'm telling you. And he tell her in another account, don't touch me. Why? Because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. I'm not holy. But a couple of days later, he goes, or the later in that day, he comes back and goes, touch me. Because <laughs> I've been to Jesus. Come on, somebody. And the very first appearance after the resurrection, again, 
wasn't to the disciples. It wasn't to somebody that was praying. It wasn't into somebody that was worshiping. It was somebody that was broken and didn't know how they were going to recover. And I want you to know that when you're tough, when things are tough and you're broken, that there is something about that that heaven is attracted to. And, and the Bible actually gives you a promise. And if you're struggling and you need to know that God is with you, I encourage you to write this down. Psalms 34, 18 says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those that are crushed in spirit. Isn't that a great promise this morning? And, and Jesus had all of earth and its people to appear to. And the first person he chose was somebody that was broken. Somebody that was hurt. He's attracted to your brokenness. Why? So that he can save and heal those that are crushed in spirit. We just read it. So look for him. And if you don't think that he was with you when the heartbreak happened, ask him, where were you, Lord? If you're so good, where were you? And I promise you, he was closer than you could imagine because he cannot lie. And I promise you, he was there this morning. So Jesus' first appearance reminds us is this. Jesus isn't as far away as we think he is. Jesus is not as far away as we think he is. Now, this is John's gospel, and he's given so much of this book to appearances and the second person you've you've probably heard of even if you're not a church goer all the time and you're not a Christian you probably heard of this guy called doubting Thomas and and here's what stinks about that this dude doubted one time and he got known for the rest of his life as doubting Thomas <laughs> and he got <laughs> isn't it funny how society will label you they'll call you by everything but your name you never read where Jesus calls him Doubting Thomas, but society is known as that. I think that's funny that that's what we do. We pick somebody's weaknesses, and then we call them by that, and we hope they get healed. How can they get healed if you're reminding of it all the time? It's even worse in the church sometimes. We do it at... Let me go a little further. I already knocked the shout out of you on Easter Sunday. My goodness. <laughs> Jesus actually appears at another place to all the disciples. But the Bible says Thomas didn't even show up. He didn't even go. You know why? He's given up. He's decided that he's done, and he doesn't believe that Jesus redirected, and he meant my purpose is over. I followed him for three years, and there's nothing left. He's dead. Watch John chapter 20, verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus. I just want to point out, if my name is Didymus, I'm going by Thomas, too. <laughs> like, I'm just, I, I get that right there. Yo, Didymus, bro, don't say that loud. Just... One of the 12, see how my mind works, pray for me, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Thomas wasn't there. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. You understand, they're actually rubbing it in his face. We got to see Jesus and you missed it. We got to be with him and you missed it. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and I put my fingers where the nails were and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And what I want you to hear is that Jesus is not turned off by your doubts and that Jesus is not turned off by your fears and your doubts will not keep Jesus from showing up in your life. He loved Thomas so much that intentionally he goes back a second time just for Thomas. Watch this, verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. You have to say peace be with you when you can walk through walls. <laughs> Read it right. The door's locked and he just stands up. And, <laughs> peace be with y'all. Calm down. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out. Don't miss this. Reach out your hand and put them in my side. Stop doubting and believe is what he was telling him. Stop doubting and believe, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. I want you to notice what Jesus doesn't say in that moment. He doesn't say, I spent three years discipling you. How could you not show up? Why would you not believe? I told you what was going to happen. 
Jesus doesn't say that to him. And why am I still having to prove myself to him? He doesn't say, you saw me on the cross and now I'm standing in front of you. Is that not enough? I just walked through a wall, walking through the wall. Is that not enough for you? He doesn't say any of those things. Jesus meets him where he's at and he says, look, I know you're in a bad way. Just put your fingers in my hand so you can believe. Could it be? Wait a minute. Did you catch this? I didn't catch this till I was studying for this message. How could Jesus know that Thomas said, I need to touch his hands and his side because Jesus wasn't even there when Thomas said it. Jesus wasn't even there when Thomas said it. Or could it be, church, that Jesus is closer than you can possibly imagine? Could it be like just when in your pain that you couldn't see him? It doesn't mean that he wasn't there. It just means the tears covered your vision. You're not hearing me. Catch this this morning. How can Jesus know that when there was Thomas was doubting and Jesus met him where he was? But then Jesus said, I need you to take a step towards me. I showed up, but reach out your hand. I'm here, but you got to do some part on, you got to do some work on your part. I got, got, a, I got up out of the grave, but you got to reach back to me. You're not hearing me. Listen to me. I'm not asking anybody here this morning to leave all your questions and to leave all your doubts behind. I'm just asking you to reach out. And when you do, you'll be able to stop doubting and believe. And after he reaches out and touches the one who met him where he was at, he makes this confession. My God and my Lord, I'm telling you, an encounter with Jesus will change your entire perspective. It'll change everything. The first person Jesus showed up for was somebody that was hurting. And then he made an appearance to somebody who was doubting. And I want you to know that his second appearance reminds us that Jesus isn't bothered by your doubts. So you might as well just reach out for him. Here's the third one. The last appearance that John's gospel will highlight. And again, I want to remind you that most of John's story is not about the resurrection, but what happened after it. It was about the heart of a God who loves reaching out for people who are far from him. And this journey sent him next to a failure. I don't know if it gets any worse than a guy named Peter. Can we just be real for a minute? We're talking about blowing it in the most catastrophic way. We're talking about looking Jesus in the eye and blowing it. Peter's having a bad weekend because Thursday of the week at the supper, he makes this first big speech in front of everybody. He said, Jesus, I'll never let you down. I'll never walk away. I am all in. Everybody else may leave, but not me. I'm all in. The good, the bad, the ugly. I am all in. And Jesus looks to him and says, before the sun comes up tomorrow, you would have denied me three times. And Peter says, no way. That is never going to happen. I love you too much. But we all know that he did. And his response to his failure is the same thing that many people do today because we think our failures drive Jesus away. And I want you to know that your failures attract Jesus to you. I'm going to change your thinking this morning. If you'll listen to the word of God, your failures attract him to you. In Mark's gospel, when Mary told the disciples that the Lord is not here, and they ran and told the other disciples, the angel of the Lord, go back and read it for yourself. The angel of the Lord said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Watch me. Listen, they were already going to tell Peter. He said, go tell the disciples. Isn't Peter a disciple? You can talk out loud here. It's okay. You're not going to scare me. Okay. Yes. He's already there. They were going to tell him. But Mark highlights the fact that Jesus knew that, that, that how Peter had failed. And he probably knew that Peter's head was in a bad space. He knew all the shame and he knew all the guilt that Peter. And he knew all the condemnation. This man that was known for boldness and the rock and he was going to build the church on him. He got talked down by a 13 year old girl. Do you know him? And he goes, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. A 13-year-old girl. And then the last time, the Bible says, Jesus and Peter are looking eye to eye. And they say, do you know him? And Peter says, I don't know him. Just a few days before, I'll never leave you. 
I'll never forsake you. And Jesus already knew what would happen. Listen to me. Jesus, he told Peter, Peter, you're going to fail. But I won't give up on you. It's called disappointment. I wonder, does anybody know what it means to be disappointed? Disappointment. You missed your appointment. Disappointment is the gap between expectation and reality. Are you tracking with me? But God knows everything. This is my favorite part of this whole message right here. God knows everything. So there can be no gap with God, which means God cannot be disappointed. In other words, God can say, can never say, I didn't see that coming. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe she did that. I can't believe they blew up and walked away. Why? Because God knew it would already come and it was going to happen and he still chose to love you. Your failures don't push him away. Your failures attract him to you. I hope you hear me this morning. He knew before you did it, and he's still showing up. And he didn't go to the ones that had it all figured out. He went to somebody that was doubting. He went to somebody that was crying, and he went to somebody that was failing miserably. All the disciples are, are together, and they're eating fish together in John's gospel. And he pulls Peter off by himself in John 21. And in verse 15, he says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, I preached this last night, and I had to pause, and so if you see me get broke up here, I'm not faking it. I mean, this, this is just in my heart. <laughs> I could see Todd in this. I don't know if you ever read the Bible and you put yourself in the Bible. If you do, it'll change your whole philosophy of how you see Jesus. When they finished these, and Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? That word love is agape. It means unconditionally. Peter, do you unconditionally love me? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter says. You know that I love you. The only problem is Peter changed the word from agape. He says, Lord, I can't go there yet. He said, I love you. And I want you to think about this. Failures. I don't know. Has anybody ever failed besides me? Any ever went to, has anybody ever went to an altar and said you'll never do it and you was back doing it by Monday? Am I the only one? Pray for me then. Pray for me then because I've done it several times. And I want you to realize this. Failures don't fall out of love with God. I never quit loving God. I just believe that I disappointed him so much that I couldn't re-up again. I just believe that I blew it so bad that he could never take me back in. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and I want you to think about this. So he says, I love you, but I love you phileo. I don't love you unconditionally. I love you like a friend. You understand before Thursday, it would have been agape, no doubt. You love me? Yes, unconditionally. But now he's failed and he doesn't think he can get back to where he was with Jesus. I love you like a friend. Watch what Jesus says. I love Jesus so much. He says, that's okay. I'll still use you. Go feed my lambs. Jesus is the only one where your past can be your past and he can still use you. <laughs> because society gives up on you, right? Again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus tries again, and he's maybe like, now that I've been here with him a moment, maybe I got past Peter's stinking thinking. Maybe I got past his shame and his guilt. Maybe we're past the point of him beating himself up every time. And maybe he understands my love for him. And he says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Peter uses the word phileo again. I love you like a friend. Watch this. Jesus said, fine, I can still use you. Take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Please don't ever forget what I'm about to say. And here, Jesus changed the word from agape to phileo. Why? He said, do you love me like a friend? Why? He was meeting Peter on the level that Peter could meet him at at that moment in his life. He said, if you can't come up any higher, I'll come to where you're at. 
I'll come to where I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but you've given up on yourself and God hasn't given up on you. And he said, if you can't get to my level, I'll come to your level this morning. If all you're capable of is meeting me right here, I would rather meet you here than not have you at all. Maybe you're here and your heart is not broken. Maybe you're not a doubter, but maybe you feel like a failure. And the appearance of Jesus remind us that Jesus isn't giving up on you, so why don't you just fall in love with him? Why don't you quit fighting it and just give in to him? And I love the fact that this is what Resurrection Day is all about, but I want to show you something about the nature and the character of God. This nature and this character of God doesn't just happen on Resurrection Sunday. God's always been treating this people this way. We just miss it. You say, Todd, how do you know? Watch this. Let's go back to the beginning, John, Genesis chapter 3. Then the eyes of both of them were open. That means they lost their innocence. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Everybody tracking with me? And they realized they were naked, which is shame. They realized they got shame and guilt. So they do what people do. They try to cover themselves up. But the only thing that can cover up your sin is the blood of Jesus. I don't have time to preach this, but I preached a message a couple months ago in Sealy, Texas called Camouflage. I never preached it before in my life, and it was all about this instance right here. They try to hide themselves from the one that made them. And I believe there's some people in this room that have done the very same thing. We try to camouflage ourselves because of the shame and the guilt we have. But God, that doesn't stop God. Why? Watch. Then the man and his wife heard the sound. They were hiding from God, and God was still looking from them. If God is this angry, mad God that has given up on you, why is he still in the garden looking for Adam and Eve? Why did he show up if he doesn't love them? He could have just thrown a lightning bolt and fired them. Come on, somebody. They were failing. Watch me. And God was looking. They had blown it, and God was searching. Your pain and your failures don't push God away. They attract him. The cool of the Lord God. And he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid them from the Lord of God among the trees of the garden. They can hear him coming and they know he's looking and they still hid. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? What are you telling me, Todd? I'm telling you, God is still making appearances today. And he's crying out this resurrection morning saying, where are you? And it's not that he doesn't know. He knows where you are, and he's inviting you out of where you are, and he's letting you know, I'll meet you where you're at. I'll show up in the garden where you're at. And not only does the first story in the Bible say this, but so does the last one. Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, the last place where you see the words of Jesus ever in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And he says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. He's making another appearance. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together with you as friends. He doesn't just want to save you. He wants to be a friend with you. Are you catching this? He doesn't want to be a God that you can't touch. He wants to sit at a table and have meals with you. It makes me love him more. I'm sure he wants barbecue, <laughs> ribs, or Mexican food. This clearly shows in the Gospels, and this clearly shows in the beginning in the book, and it clearly shows at the end of the book that God is still showing up and making appearances. And he wants to show up in you, and he wants to show up for you. And, and I, think, I think that deserves a good shout of praise this morning. I think that that deserves a great amount of thankfulness. Because here's what I always need you to remember. He showed up to somebody that was broken. He showed up to somebody that was doubting. And he showed up to a failure. And I hope you see this. Your issues don't push God away. They actually attract God to you. So if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God, today's a great day to get one. It's just a great day to get one. And you may already be rehearsing your list of excuses of why you can't. I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done that. Did you look Jesus eye to eye? 
Or maybe you're like Paul. Paul's going out killing people, murdering them. And God takes him and says, hey, I need you to write two-thirds of the New Testament. A murderer. Can you imagine the first time Paul preaches? Y'all going to Paul's service? I shoot, no, I ain't going to Paul's service. That fool capping people, I am not going, he ain't not getting me. Not today, going night, night, not today. My mama didn't raise no fool, Paul, not getting me. You say, Todd, why are you telling me that? Sometimes you have to outlive your reputation. And I say that because for the first three years, people still thought I was selling drugs out of the worship center. If I was, we would have had a bigger church and nicer facilities. <laughs> I was renting a building from the Jehovah's Witness. Come on, we weren't rolling. If I was selling dope, we would have had a, a crystal palace. Come on. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to outlive your reputation. I don't have time to talk you into believing in me. Just watch. Just watch and see if I blow up. I'm going to make some mistakes, but I ain't going to blow up and go back and get doped up. Why? Because I've tasted and see that he's good. But what I want you to catch more than anything, so I grew up in church. Church didn't grow up in me. And I can't tell you how many times I answered the altar call and said, man, I'm done. I am done with drugs. I'm done having sex with my girlfriend. I'm done with all these things. I, I was just a little hood rat, and I'm done. And Monday, I mean, it's not even Monday. Sometimes Sunday night, I was already getting high again. The crazy thing is, Damien, I meant it when I prayed it. I was done. But my flesh was out of control, and nobody told me how to disciple that. That's why we have a class called Freedom here to help you. Because I'm telling you, you can get saved and still want to get high. Why? Because your flesh ain't saved. Your flesh ain't never going to say, get up and go to church at 8.30. Your flesh ain't never going to tell you to go to church, but your spirit man will pull you there. And what I hope you catch this morning, more than anything, is we have a God that he wants to meet you where you're at. You don't got to get polished. Because here's the other excuse you'll tell. When I get this done, and when I get this done, and when I get all these things clear, then I'm going to get in church, and I'm going to do right. You can't get right without Jesus. Because how many times have you said that and you still broke, busted, and disgusted? You ain't got to lie, Craig. You ain't got to lie. You can't do it by yourself. You weren't meant to do it by yourself. That's why we have a Savior that comes to us. And then when he goes away, he says, guys, I'm going to go away. Because everything I've done right now, I've done from the outside. But now I want to do a work on the inside. And I'm going to send somebody called the Holy Spirit. And he's going to dwell on the inside of you. And he's going to give you the ability to do greater things than I'd ever done. And he tells them, don't go witness. Listen, this is what people do. They get saved and they try to do it on their own. Jesus says, don't go witness. Don't join a worship team. Don't go try to win nobody. Don't do nothing until you get filled up with the Holy Ghost. Because if you, if they even had the Holy Ghost. And them two disciples went out and got beat up by two demons. Read it. Full of the Holy. You got, you know you got whooped when you walk home butt naked. Read the Bible. They got whooped butt naked. You can't go home and say, see the, well, you ought to see the other pool. Full, you butt naked. It don't matter what they look like. So the excuses are gone. I'm taking all of that off the table. And I want you to bow your head. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? What are you saying to me? Maybe you're heartbroken. Maybe you're here with all your doubts. You're like, I don't even know if I believe in God. That's okay. It's okay. He's, he's big enough to be okay with you wondering who he is. Or maybe you're here and you're just like, man, I'm just a failure. I can't even go a whole week. I can't even go a whole week and keep what I said I would do. No one's looking around. Heads are bowed. And you're just be honest and say, Todd, by raising your hand, I need a relationship with God. I'm tired of being heartbroken. I'm tired of being a failure, and I'm tired of being in my doubts. And I, I just need Jesus to meet me where you're, where you, I'm at. 
If that's you, would you just lift your hand this morning? Yeah, whether you come and let me pray for you this morning or not, will you just let me, let, don't, don't put them down yet. I, I want to see them real quickly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. Now, in just a minute, the worship team's going to play a song. And when they play this song, if you need prayer for salvation, if you need prayer for doubt, you need prayer for fear, you need fear or heartbrokenness or fear, any of those, this is what this time is for. We do this every week. Nobody's going to be shocked if you come up here for prayer. We expect you to. So as they begin to sing this song, if you need prayer for anything, I want you to come. Don't miss this this morning.